you tell us something about what you know about what you call the secret team? Who are the secret team? Whether there are people still around today that you knew in the 60s? Um, and mm -hmm. what kind of activities they were involved in? Well, uh, you mentioned the secret team, and it's a rather popular term since it's been uh, popularized by, uh, by Ollie North and, and Secord and the rest of them. Uh, actually, the book I wrote called The Secret Team is autobiographical. It explains my nine years' work in the Pentagon in this kind of business. Uh, actually, I had been in, in uh, intelligence-type work long before I came to the Pentagon. I was at the Cairo Conference in 1943 and the Tehran Conference in 1943 when there were some uh, uh, very important uh, secret operations carried out. I was in the Soviet Union in 1944 and in Turkey in 1944. So that through all this period, beginning way back in the 40s, it was clear that even though I was working close to men like Winston Churchill, I lived right across the street from him once when he was in Marrakech and so on, you, you would see that they would be carrying out some kind of instructions. Uh, I think most of us don't realize that Chiang Kai-shek was at Tehran. No one was ever told that. It's never been in the news. I can show you where it is in certain research books now. That was a covert operation. Why did they bring him there? Under whose direction was such as that done. You ask yourself those questions when you see these people working. I've worked in a room like this with Alan Dulles, right at home with him, with John Foster Dulles right there, and listened to the two of them talking about how we're going to do this or how we're going to do that. And then I've seen John, John Foster Dulles pick up the telephone and call somebody overseas. And you realize they're taking an input, taking instructions. They're not the top men. So that in my own work, and I know I'm not the only one that writes this. Uh, Buckminster Fuller has written this kind of thing. Even Churchill's book contained this kind of work. There is a high cabal, the words that Churchill used, that, uh, that runs things. Now, we'll never describe those people. Their greatest strength is their anonymity, and they know that. Now, at lower levels, there are secret teams in the sense that, that governments or uh, parts of governments don't stop them. Uh, as we see through this whole Iran hostage exchange thing. The Germans were involved, the Israelis were involved, the Swiss were involved, the Swedish were involved, Otto Palmer was involved, the British were involved, all around the world, the South Koreans were involved. Well, what kind of a team is there that can be assembled to do a job like the hostage exchange and selling arms to Iran and so on and so on? That's not any part of one government, but it's a most effective organization. And in many ways, that organization worked under, um, well, nominally, uh, Ali North, but the people at North was working for. So the closer you get to this type of operation and the more years you spend in this kind of operation, you recognize that there is a secret team that even governmental structures does not encompass. It's a very powerful, large organization. The people at the top are faceless. We will never know them. And I, I don't put people like Ronald Reagan or Winston Churchill or Franklin Roosevelt at the top. They're people above them. What about LBJ? Would you put him in that category? Certainly not. Yeah, no, Lyndon Johnson was a, one of the finest members of the Senate that we ever had as being effective, effective member of the U.S. Senate. But if you work closely with senators, you will find out they're taking orders from people all the time. And I have worked very closely with them. In fact, one of my jobs while I was in the Pentagon for these nine years was to be the military emissary to certain key senators where I would walk in their office and say, General so-and-so has asked me to tell you that we are going to do this kind of a program. Senator would talk about it a little bit, and thank you very much, and go back. Now, the senator was accepting what we told him, not the other way around, you see. Uh, Lyndon Johnson became president uh, after Kennedy's murder. He'd been a rather effective vice president. But if you look carefully at his tenure in office, I think you'll find out that it had certain ups and downs, especially in that speech when he said he was not going to run again for president and all, where you have a feeling of somebody has just told that man what to do when he's doing it. I was looking through the peephole of the glass. As I was watching Dr. King, I saw him look over toward the boarding house. And then whenever he looked back, like he was gonna look into the parking area, 
that's when he come up off of the grating and that's when he was shot. I felt very bad inside that this had to happen in Memphis, Tennessee. The weight of world condemnation came down on the city of Memphis on the 4th of April, 1968. This was the killing of a major world figure. How could they have allowed it to happen? There were even suspicions that the Memphis authorities were accessories to the murder and involved in a cover-up. The man convicted of King's murder, James Earl Ray, still protests his innocence. In this film, we show new evidence that there was indeed a conspiracy and that the trail leads into the heart of government itself.